For more than 25 years and counting, fans have been wondering, what is the One Piece? Or maybe, where is the One Piece? And an equally important question might just be, why is the One Piece? What treasure could possibly make the Pirate King himself laugh to the point of tears? But also be one that could potentially bring the entire world government to its knees? Is it a weapon or just some type of long-running joke? Well, what if I told you that the One Piece is the physical key that allows Luffy to make the world into what it should be? A symbol of the world after the dawn, you could say. And what if I said that our very own singing skeleton may just tell us everything that we need to know about Joy Boy's history? Well, please join me as I walk you through what, where, and why is the One Piece. But first, please help your boy out and drop a like on the video. This is definitely the biggest project that I've ever done and I know you're going to at least walk away knowing something new. So if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe because I got a lot more coming. On to the Mega Theory. Uh, yeah. Of all the mysteries in the world of One Piece, the ones that have intrigued me the most since my very first episode are that of the pirates. How has only one pirate successfully conquered the seas and found that final treasure in 800 years? What could Roger possibly find and leave behind at that place that made him want to begin the great pirate era after his execution? We learned from Inurashi that Laugh Tale can only be found by reading all four load poneglyphs, and he made it seem as if these four poneglyphs will act as coordinates to a certain point on the map. But how could a stationary island possibly remain hidden for this long? Does it move periodically or potentially just reside under the sea? Well, I think I've actually managed to find the answers to all of those questions thanks to a number of people that chipped in that I'll try to mention during the video, as well as taking my time researching all of Oda's smallest hints to Joy Boy. Because we all know how Oda loves to twist past moments in the story, no matter how small, to amplify the current events that we're reading. Sometimes he does this with entire arcs, like Saba Odi, where we returned after two years and essentially had the same exact setup, but the outcome was inverted to show our crew's strength over those last two years. But Oda also does this with smaller singular moments as well, such as sun god Nika. The first image we saw of Nika connects to this image of Luffy and Skypiea, which is a cool panel in its own right, and despite being one of Oda's favorite panels that he's ever drawn, nobody could have predicted all of its ties to Gear 5th and Nika himself at the time that it was printed. However, once that connection was made in Chapter 1017 and 1044, it recontextualized a lot of what we saw in Skypea and has given rise to all sorts of new theories and parallels. This is an example of how something seemingly insignificant in the past can become significant thanks to future events. So I wanted to use that logic and go back through the story with a fine tooth comb and find more hidden connections to Joy Boy, Nika, and Luffy that have yet to be discovered. I mean, we've already had one slip under our nose with Luffy's pose in Skypea. So where else can Oda be hiding hints for the greatest secrets of the One Piece world? And wouldn't you know it, we actually missed another example of that same exact Nika pose, except this time it was by Brook. This was back in chapter 635, and you can even see one of the fishmen smile at his performance. And we now know that making others smile is something that Nika did in the past. This is an extremely important panel, and I promise I'm going to circle back to it later. But I think it would instead be best to begin our discussion with the most important common denominator between Joy Boy, Nika, and Luffy, which is the Gomu Gomu no Mi. And yes, I'll be calling it by that name throughout the video because A, it's easier, and B, it actually is just the Gomu Gomu no Mi. And you can check out these two videos in the description to learn why. But obviously, Luffy, Joy Boy, and Nika all use the powers of this fruit. And thanks to the context of what Roger said at Laugh Tale, Joy Boy is tied to Laugh Tale directly and is probably even the one who left the One Piece behind. So I figured that anything dealing with this fruit has to be put under a magnifying glass. So from here on out, I want to look at every potential tie to the Gomu Gomu no Mi in the story that I could find, and then kind of consider it in light of the new powers that we now know that it has. And what I found will surprise you. And at the bare minimum, you will not be able to look at another Laugh Tale theory the same after today. I think we can all agree that Laugh Tale and the Imperative Final War will be some of the most significant moments in the entire story of One Piece. I mean, that's what we've been building up for for over 25 years now. So let me throw this idea at you. What if Oda hid all of his hints for the most significant arc inside the most insignificant one? 
at least in many people's eyes, which is Long Ring Long Land? The answer is hell no. Now, before you question everything and leave the video, let me show you one unquestionably convincing piece of evidence, just so you know I'm not full of and that would be this panel. The old man, named Tanji, explains that the reason everything is stretched out is because they feel free, so they can stretch longer and taller than normal. Doesn't that sound familiar to you? Even if this is the first time you've been acquainted with this panel, you could probably see how important that line is right away. Because being free is exactly how Luffy's powers work. Once he awakens, he even becomes freer than normal and is only limited by imagination. And we even had a reminder about this freedom in chapter 1061, where Luffy says that Gear 5th is when he's truly free. So how in the world can everyone and everything on Long Ring Long Land become stretched out for a similar reason to Luffy? Well, that question is what led me to find all the answers that I'm sharing with you today. So now that you know I might actually be onto something, let me go ahead and start back from the top. Long Ring Long Land is viewed as almost a throwaway arc by many, partially due to it being stuck between the highs of Skypea and Water 7, but also partially due to our Davy back fight against the very lame Foxy Pirates. The only real plot progression occurred at the end when we met Aokiji. It's almost like Oda was just having fun and that leads many people to disregard this arc or simply skip over it in terms of the overarching story. You could almost say that it has been hidden from us in a sense, which is doubly interesting when you consider that the island itself is almost completely hidden away from the world. The first reason is simply its structure. It's made of about 10 points around a circle that are all connected under the water, which right away hides about 95% of it. And each of those points is a boring, empty plane. When the Straw Hats first arrived, Arrived, only Luffy was interested in even exploring it, and I'll definitely discuss that point more later on, but this is yet another reason why it's kind of hidden. I mean, why would anyone bother exploring it at all if there's just nothing to do or nothing to steal? And on top of that, a log pose will only point you to one of the ten points before directing you away to somewhere else completely, because it's actually all just one big island hidden mostly under the sea. Again, another way in which this island stays hidden from the world. And as many of us remember, once a year during Agua Laguna, the island becomes a full crown shape again, which allows the villagers to travel to another point on foot. So overall, this basically just means that if you did find this island, all you'd see is a boring empty plane and then get directed away from it. And the only time that someone could see the rest of the island under the sea is during Agua Laguna. And we were basically told that no ship could possibly sail during it only the sea train. And isn't it kind of weird how perfectly crown shaped it is? And I'll get back to this later because once the crew walks around and sees that everything and everyone is stretched out, we even see Chopper and Usopp begin to stretch out too. And they even ask what kind of island is this? Since people seem to be affected by the freedom of this island even right after they arrive there, maybe there's something going on with the environment itself that causes this phenomenon. I mean, we've seen Logi awakenings affect environments permanently and sure, the Gomu Gomu isn't a Logia, but it already has properties of both Paramecias and Zones, and it can at least affect environments temporarily, so I feel like I'd just be a fool to rule out the chance that the fruit can affect environments on a permanent basis as well. I mean, one look at Zunisha's legs also begs into question if those were stretched out also, but we'll definitely talk about that more later too. And since the last user of the Gomu Gomu seemed to be Joy Boy, it would all probably have to be Joy Boy that did this if this was the case. And that idea gets easier even more mind-blowing when you see this comment from Tanji. As soon as Luffy knocks him down from the stilts, he looks directly at Luffy and without hesitation he says, long time no see. And after a reminder from Usopp, he says, oh yeah, I haven't seen your face. Maybe I'm reaching way too deep here, but could he possibly just be mistaking Luffy for Joy Boy? As if he could tell he had some will of Joy Boy, or at least he was free just like him, which led to him getting confused. If that seems like a stretch, keep in mind that Oda's depiction of Davy Jones looks exactly like this old man Tanji. Davy was an infamous pirate from ancient times that was involved with the first Davy back fight on Hachinosu Island, so I don't think that we can rule out anything that this old man is talking about. We will discuss this in greater detail later in the video, but I just want to keep hammering home all these odd connections that point us right back to Long Ring Longland. 
And one connection that connects this island to Laugh Tale directly happens during Chapter 304, when we first arrive to Long Ring Longland. Usopp famously gets I'll die if I go to that island disease. And the only other person that's gotten this disease in the story was Buggy right before he got to Laugh Tale. Could this possibly mean that they were near the same place when they got this disease? It could be that some people just get sick when near a certain area or near a certain something. And something that I haven't seen a lot of people bring up is that we've seen something similar to this with Roger and Odin as well as Luffy and Momo when all of these people went to Zoe. All four of them felt a little queasy when near the island and they were the only ones from their respective crews to feel that way. Kind of like how Usopp and Buggy were the only ones to feel that way near their respective islands. And if you think about it, Usopp and Buggy are kind of similar in a lot of ways. They're cowards but are also captains, right? So am I then proposing that last tail is at or near Long Ring Longland? Well, that's honestly a strong possibility. But what I can say for sure is that there has to be some type of connection between the two, or at least Long Ring Longland and Joy Boy. And remember what I said earlier about Long Ring Longland being crown shaped? one day out of the year? Well, who else wears crowns? Kings, like the Pirate King. Maybe that's a sign that Agua Laguna is the one day a year that the Pirate King can be crowned. There was even an anime-only episode that told us that the water from Agua Laguna has salt from the All Blue, and that water is from Long Ring Longland. I mean, I know it's technically not canon, but like, why are they so specific? There is another idea that I like that even goes a step further that I'll go ahead and share later on in the video, but there is honestly a very strong case to be made that Laugh Tale is right here at the center of all 10 points of Long Ring Longland. And it's an especially strong candidate if you assume that Laugh Tale is stationary and is actually found at four intersecting points, just like Inurashi mentioned. So for those reasons, let me go ahead and briefly paint you a picture of what Laugh Tale being at Long Ring Longland could look like. So for argument's sake, let's just say that the entrance to Laugh Tale is inside the crown and is only accessible during low tide, aka Agua Laguna. So right off the bat, you need to go there on one specific day out of the year. And since log poses don't work there, you'd have to have a map with directions. You'd also have to kind of be there ahead of time because once the tides lower, you wouldn't even be able to enter into inside the crown because there will be walls there at that point. You could almost say that those walls are acting as a border, not unlike the borders of Wano. And wait, didn't Wano have something underneath it too? An ancient city with poneglyphs and even an ancient weapon? I mean, Long Ring Longland is basically the same thing except under the water and crown shape. I mean, it would be a perfect place to hide treasure though, because who would ever bother to stay in the center of this boring ring of islands during the craziest storm of the year and try to navigate without log poses helping you? It's almost like you just have to know specifically when and where to be to ever have a chance of finding it. And if you think Laugh Tale being hidden under an island isn't a good enough hiding spot, where has Pluton been this whole time? I mean, we didn't have specifics about Kaido's plans, really, but he was there for 20 years and still didn't find Pluton. I mean, maybe he knew it was there, but he didn't actually get it, right? And it stayed hidden from everyone else for 800 years. So what's stopping Laugh Tail from just being under a boring island that nobody cares about? And given Long Ring Longland's peculiar shape and the freedom that they all feel, wouldn't it make sense that Joy Boy stretched this island out using his awakening? Maybe he set all of this up himself because he was already familiar with Agua Laguna's tides, and he probably just figured that this would be a perfect place to hide the treasure until he returned in the future. And that idea actually gets a lot crazier when you consider the fact that Water 7 is very close by, and it also has an ancient city beneath it that is also underwater just like Long Ring Longland. And we know that this city, as well as Water 7 itself, Itself, has been gradually sinking because of the floods of Agua Laguna. But think about that. Why would an ancient city even build themselves somewhere with intense floods in the first place? Unless at one point in time, there weren't any floods at all. However, if one day that all changed, then it would easily explain how both islands became mostly, or just entirely, submerged over time. And also why Joy Boy may have wanted to stretch out parts of Long Ring Longland so that the people who live there wouldn't drown. But that isn't all. 
because there's also good reason to believe that this city is the one with the poneglyph that describes Uranus's location. I have so much more to say about this, but I'm just going to keep it brief for this video. So during Roger's flashback, Water 7 was the first place that he stopped while searching for that last load poneglyph and collecting all the other poneglyphs as well. But it's the only place that we didn't see them actually interact with one. And at this point of his journey, Roger was rushing to become Pirate King before his death. So I don't think he was just stopping by just so he could say hi to Tom. Roger probably knew that there was history there and he wanted Odin to read it for him, even if it didn't end up being a load poneglyph. I mean, they did the same exact thing in Skypiea too. The only place they went to that we didn't get to see a poneglyph was Water 7. And we already know that the other two ancient weapons locations were revealed by poneglyphs that were found in ancient cities without a load poneglyph, being Skypiea and Alabasta, which makes Water 7 the perfect location to hold the location of the final ancient weapon, Uranus, since we know that the final load poneglyph was found in Fishman Island instead. I mean, we all know that Uranus has close ties to the sky, and many people have theorized that it could have something to do with the tides just like the moon does. And if this poneglyph is really found in the same place that becomes flooded by Agua Laguna, well, you can probably already see where I'm going with this. What if Long Ring Longland in Water 7 used to avoid the floods in the past thanks to something managing the tides for them. Just like Poseidon was meant to help the people of Fishman Island, could Uranus have been used to help the people of Water 7? And maybe they were meant to fix the tides for good at some point, but much like Poseidon, Joy Boy was unable to fulfill that promise until 800 years in the future. Once the Void Century happened, Joy Boy may have just known that those annual tides were going to return, so he used them to his advantage to create the perfect hiding place for his grandest treasure, and the effects still make those inhabitants feel free to this very day. And so while that option is an extremely strong one, I want to pivot to a different idea for Laugh Tale that I like just a little bit more, and that is that Laugh Tale is located inside of a whale. This idea is not something new, so I'll only cover it briefly, but I do want to say that even if the One Piece is found under Long Ring Long Land or elsewhere, there is still likely a very important whale waiting for Joy Boy to return, and that whale's name is Davy Jones. After all the connections between Long Ring Longland, Joy Boy, and Laugh Tale that I've said so far, I hope you can agree that anything that ties to that arc has to be put under a magnifying glass. And since we were introduced to Davy back fights here, which ties directly into Davy Jones, I want to take a deeper dive into this legend as well. And Oda actually discussed Davy in SBS 38, and even drew this picture of him that I mentioned earlier. Doesn't he look identical to Tanji? We've seen Oda characterize things before, such as swords, which looked somewhat like their creators. And while I definitely don't think Tanjit himself created Davy or anything, I think it can at least prove that Davy has some kind of tie to Long Ring Longland, which we now know has some very strange ties to Joy Boy and potentially even Laugh Tale. And so I'll get right back to that point in a moment, but first I feel like I need to briefly cover the reasoning why Laugh Tale could be inside of a whale for all those who might be uninitiated. So first off, a whale would just be the perfect hiding place for an island. It would all always be under the sea and moving, so it's basically its own natural defense mechanism. And if the whale is anything like Laboon, it could even fight off people on its own. And speaking of Laboon, he is literally a whale with an island inside, so we know it's possible to do so. And his species is literally known as island whales. Plus, he is a whale that befriended somebody who died, came back to life, and is supposed to come back and meet him. And we now know that Joy Boy died and came back to life in the form of Luffy. Plus, Crocus has been the laugh tale, and he's the one who modified Laboon in the first place. So maybe that's where he got the idea. And during our time under the sea in Fishman Island, we came across other island whales that even had the same scars as Laboon. Brooke actually sang Bink Sake to them and they had a pleasant reaction, almost as if they recognized the song. So how could that be? Shanks and Roger also sang that song with their respective crews, so this makes the island whales that much more ominous to me. 
So those are some of the most prominent reasons that I've seen for why many people believe Laugh Tale could be inside of a whale, but I think there's a hell of a lot more to it than that. And let's also just consider the fact that, as I was saying earlier, Brooke's story is all about a guy who befriended a whale, died, and came back to life with the goal of meeting his whale friend again and playing that song. So what if Joy Boy is just a grander version of that story? I mean, we've already seen Joy Boy die and then come back in the form of Luffy, and just like how Luffy Boon will only recognize Brooke because of his afro, Zunisha only recognized Joy Boy after Luffy activated Gear 5th. I mean, all we really need is for the Poneglyphs to point to another whale at the end of the journey to complete the parallel. And take a look at the freaking panel from Fishman Island that I mentioned before. Brooke is basically in the Nika pose, and we even see him making someone smile, which was even mentioned by the Gorosei when discussing Nika's power. Am I proposing that Brooke has some deeper connection to Joy Boy? Basically, but I'll touch on that more later. And keep in mind that Luffy has wanted a musician more than any other position since he set out as a pirate. And given Bink Sake's importance to the story, I think this could easily all tie together. I mean, Brooke's laugh is literally in the f***ing song for crying out loud. <laughs> And let's not forget to mention that all Laboon, and all the other island whales apparently, wanted to do was destroy the Red Line. But Luffy stopped him until he returned at the end of his journey. And many people have already theorized that destroying the Red Line is the entire point of the One Piece. And that is exactly where Davy Jones himself comes into play. So that means it's time to discuss who exactly Davy the Whale was, and how they were connected to Joy Boy. And I believe this whale to be none other than the very same same Davy Jones that was involved in the first ever Davy backfight. Robin told us that Davy Jones is a cursed pirate from ancient times who lives under the sea and takes all the ships and treasure that sink to the seafloor. This tells you right away that Davy could very well just be a sea creature since he literally lives on the bottom of the seafloor. And we all should know by now that Oda does nothing but ankle breakers when it comes to pieces of lore like this. I mean, Odin didn't even think Shirahoshi she would be a mermaid and he read the damn poneglyphs. So I think we need to read between the lines a little bit when it comes to stories just like this. Plus, when we were inside of Laboon, we actually saw sunken ships and treasure at the bottom of the ocean that he had inside of him, which may be a hint to what creature Davy might be. And Oda even talked more about Davy Jones in SBS 38 and added that there was a lying, no good pirate named Davy Jones a greedy deck chief who was famous for putting all the crew's valuables in his own locker. He was so wicked, even for a pirate, that one day the devil himself cursed Davy to live on the bottom of the sea forever, swabbing the deck of a sunken ship and placing all the sunken treasure into his own locker where it would never be seen again. Between these two explanations, we can see that Davy was indeed from ancient times, but also cursed to do something forever. Does that remind you of anyone, like maybe Zunisha, who just happens to be a gargantuan 800 year old elephant that was also once a companion of Joy Boy. But they were even commanded to wander the seas until Momonosuke came along. And what else did you say, Oda? Davy was cursed by the devil himself? After seeing Zunisha's situation and all the vilifying of pirates in the One Piece story, I think this devil can be nobody other than Joy Boy himself. And think about what else Oda said. He was famous for putting all the crew's valuables in his own locker. And if our entire conversation is about the One Piece being hidden inside of a whale, perhaps what this really means is that Davy was just the locker where Joy Boy and his crew stored all of their treasure. I mean, that would be a pretty safe place to hide it, right? And maybe Davy Jones was just Joy Boy's entire ship. I mean, what a better way to sail the seas than inside of a whale that protects you. It's like the verse of the Rumbar Pirates, basically. Instead of protecting Laboon, the whale could protect the crew. And I want to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my boy Dire Regulus. This man had his own Davy Jones theory that gave me all sorts of ideas for this one, so I definitely recommend that you go check him out. And his video gave me the idea that maybe the whale's name is just Davy, and Joy Boy's original name is Jones, or Jonah, like in the stories of Jonah and the Whale, where he gets eaten and stays there for three days and three nights. Joy Boy and Jonah share the first couple letters, and Luffy's nicknames are never that far off from his real name, like Luffy, Taro, or Lushi. So I just wanted to go ahead and throw this idea out there because I thought it was interesting. But something important that Oda also mentioned was that Davy was famous. 
so other people probably knew about the treasure hidden inside. And this could also potentially connect back to the first ever Davy back fight, which we obviously know that Davy was a part of. And then Robin, who seems to know everything important by the way, said that the Davy back fights began on Pirate's Paradise Island, which is also known as Hachinosu and was once the home base of rocks and is now the home base of Blackbeard. This is also interesting given the slight resemblance between Afro Luffy's chest tattoo and Rock's pirate symbol. And from what we've seen so far, the common theme with Hachinosu is that bad pirates stay there. So if the Davy back fight originated on that island, it was likely started by the bad guys who stayed there as opposed to the good guys which would be Joy Boy's crew. And if Davy was famous for holding all this treasure inside of him, perhaps the story goes something like this. He was stolen by the strong evil pirates and then taken back to Hachinosu and then Joy Boy had to go win him back by playing their probably rigged games. I mean, Davy back fights have always been a game of human resources after all, so pirates could steal other pirate members. And just think about the name of the challenge itself, a Davy back fight. Perhaps it was called this because the first one was a fight to get Davy back. Let me know if you like that idea down in the comments. But of course, Joy Boy probably won this fight fair and square just like Luffy did. And as much as everyone hates Foxy, I think this gives us a good reason to put his fight with Luffy under the magnifying glass as well. Because I believe there's even a chance that this fight is what gave rise to the Void Century. Emu seems like the type of person to have everything meticulously planned out since they've been running the show for 800 years apparently. So I could easily see them putting together some rigged games like Foxy to try and collect as many strong people to his side as possible so he could take over the world. Just like Rocks and Blackbeard have tried to do. But of course, Joy Boy would have won his fight and Emu just may have gone back on his word, which led to the Void Century in the first place. And whether that part is true or not, the Void Century did eventually happen, and Joy Boy had to leave his treasure somewhere. So where else would he have left it other than his own private treasure chest, inside Davy Jones? Or in other words, he hid the One Piece inside Davy Jones' locker. And if Davy truly was commanded to go scoop up ships and treasure on the seafloor all this time until Joy Boy came back, Back, then the treasure at Laugh Tale is probably immense at this point, truly worthy of the great pirate era that Roger set forth in the past. And this same Davy Jones would be over 800 years old at this point. And if Zunisha is any comparison, Davy has to be massive. We also can't rule out that Joy Boy stretched either of these two with his awakening. So imagination is truly the limit on their size. And if Joy Boy could command it to collect treasure, maybe he could leave behind other instructions as well, like showing up to a certain place once a year, or maybe only allowing certain people inside who meet certain conditions that they learn from the Poneglyphs. Or maybe just like Zunisha, it knows that only a certain someone can command it, and perhaps the One Piece is what's required to do so. But where exactly would this whale be located? Well, how about right under our old friend, Long Ring Longland? And speaking of our friend, it's time to show you what is maybe one of Oda's biggest hints towards Laugh Tale to date, which is the color page for chapter 471, titled My Friend. Notice how peculiar this scene is. The whole crew is underwater with some various fish swimming around, but at the top is an absolutely massive whale with a crown on its head. I know it's just a color page, but Oda has foreshadowed things from these before. And the title, My Friend, surely isn't doing any favors in hiding it. And now that we know an ancient weapon has been under the entire Wano country for 800 years, I just can't rule out the chance that a whale has been waiting for Joy Boy under Long Ring Longland for 800 years either. Imagine if that whale's crown was the size of Long Ring Longland itself. That might even give you an idea of just how big Davy Jones really could be. So maybe during Agua Laguna you can access the whale via Long Ring Longland and then find Laugh Tale and thus the One Piece. Another option could just be that the whale could be hiding all year but is summoned to the surface via some certain instructions, probably involving
involving playing Bink Sake. And we actually saw something just like this yet again in chapter 304 when we first got the Long Ring Longland. Oda really packed that chapter tight, I'm telling you. He included a four-page non-canon story where the crew summons a series of rainbow eels that are all wearing straw hats. Luffy even mentioned trying to summon a whale before these eels surfaced, potentially hinting that the whale can be summoned with the right song as well. And maybe the Poneglyphs include these instructions. Both of these are good options, but I'm leaning toward the whale just being right under Long Ring Longland like Pluton is under Wano, and it's just waiting to be moved for its final purpose. Both of these options would be a good way to not only keep Laugh Tale hidden, but also make sure that a crew who has actually read the Poneglyphs would be the only ones to access the final island. And it may also explain why Roger's crew was singing this song on their way to Laugh Tale in his flashback. Regardless of whether Laugh Tale is inside a whale or not, we still have to answer one question though. If Roger had all of this proper information and even made it to Laugh Tale himself, what stopped him from going even further? Why was he too early? And why did Rayleigh say that the Straw Hats may come to a different conclusion than they did? Oda has told us that the One Piece is a physical object, so what could be so funny that the entire crew of the King of the Pirates laughed so hard that they cried. Basically what I'm asking is, what is the One Piece? Well, I think it's the one piece of something that can make the world one piece again. It's the ultimate treasure of Joy Boy, the sign of strength and friendship that can persevere even after you're nothing but bones. And it's the only sign that lets Davy the Whale know that Joy Boy has finally made his way back. I believe that the one piece is an afro. <laughs> but not just any afro, mind you, Joy Boy's afro. It's the sign of strength, the sign of friendship, and the sign of the world as it's supposed to be. Even as recently as chapter 1060, Brooke referenced how the swirling eddy looks just like an afro. And the eddy was just a swirling ball of water which resembles the entire planet. An entire planet without borders. The treasure is the one piece of hair that resembles the world as one piece. One without barriers like the red line that splits the world in two. A world split in two would be two-piece. And what did Luffy call Foxy during their final fight? Two-piece head. Think about that again. Two-piece. If Foxy's split hair made him two-piece head to Luffy, would that make Luffy the one-piece head? You may think this is a joke, but think again about all the other connections I've laid out between Joy Boy and Long Ring Longland. Think about the fact that the one-piece made Roger laugh so hard that he cried. The final fight of this arc may have been a joke in our eyes, but the real joke may be how much Oda hid from us in plain sight. And is it a coincidence that Brooke was also found in the the same pose as Sun God Nika? The times we've seen this pose, particularly in front of the moon, have been so insanely important that I think we'd just be foolish to ignore it. Brooke is also so happy and cheerful, and he uses his music to put smiles on the faces of those around him. Does that not sound like something that Nika would do? This could even explain why Luffy wanted a musician first and foremost. Based off the importance of Bink Sake, I feel like Joy Boy himself was probably a musician, or at the very least he was in a crew like the Rumbar Pirate that sang that song to their heart's content. Like I said, Brooke's laugh is in the song. We were even told that afros give you power on two separate occasions, by Usopp and Sanji. Usopp has basically been proven to be a prophet at this point by having all of his lies come true, and Sanji knows plenty of things that he tends to keep under wraps. Perhaps there is actually something more to the afro than meets the eye. I mean, the afro is technically the reason that Luffy won that fight, because a piece of mirror got stuck inside of it, and this is how Luffy reflected a slow, slow beam back at Foxy. And Think about the other afros that we've seen in the story. One is Sengoku who has a Buddha fruit and his afro gets beefier and more textured when in his Buddha form. This is more interesting when you consider the fact he's another mythical Hito Hito user. And another example would actually be Gaimon, who is literally a man stuck in a treasure chest with an afro that is stuck on an island with a bunch of empty treasure chests. It's as if the only treasure on that island at all is the afro itself. Shout out to Matt Cypher on Discord for bringing 
bringing some of these points up, man. I mean, Oda would probably send a cease and desist if he could because of how many of his secrets get revealed in our discussions. So shout out to him. And also shout out to Rabbithead14 for being an original Afro Gang member and also posting that Sun God Brook panel the other night. But let's get back on track because we also have to consider the fact that an Afro undoubtedly checks the box for something that would make the entire Roger Pirate crew laugh. I mean, think about it. You travel the seas for decades, fighting powerful pirate crews and enemy marines, all to find an afro that has been left in pristine condition for centuries that can somehow supposedly turn the entire world on its head. I'd probably want to live in that guy's era too. I mean, imagine if they finally arrive, walk up to the One Piece, and it's just a grave with an afro at the top. And what's kind of funny about this is that's exactly what Brooks Crew's gravesite looks like on Thriller Bark. It's a big stone cross with a skull at the top that has a giant afro made of wood. After all the ties that I have mentioned between music, this dang afro, and Joy Boy, can you even rule out that this grave is just a lesser version of what we're gonna get at Laugh Tale? The skull even has horns, which could be a tie to Oars and a hint that he may have been Joy Boy. And if that sounds crazy to you, well, Wizard of Oars has actually covered this in great detail over on the Marshall D. Preach channel, so I definitely recommend you go check that out. It's a theory that has come to grow on me more and more over the years. But as for the Afro, it has to be the one thing that Joy Boy knew he couldn't lose. It was his treasure that he had to protect no matter the cost, just like Brooke. If the afro is damaged, his dream can never become true, because Joy Boy knew that at some point he would return in the future and his afro would be needed to let Davy know that he has returned. Without that, Davy could never be used for his final purpose. And maybe the reason Roger was unable to do this himself was because Joy Boy has to wear it specifically, meaning you not only need the afro, but to use it while in gear fifth which we already know is a sign that Joy Boy has returned thanks to Zunisha. So let's get back to the idea that Joy Boy's story could be Brooke's story, but just on an entirely new level. Perhaps he was close friends with a whale in the past, died at some point, but knew he would come back in the future, potentially just in the form of Will or through the Devil Fruit, and the only way for Davy to recognize Joy Boy again was with his afro, just like Brooke. And in the event that the One Piece did fall into the wrong hands, Joy Boy probably added Gear 5th into the mix so that only somebody with his will could command Davy. By combining these factors, he knew that only the right person would be able to use Davy for his final purpose. But what is that purpose? Why would someone want to command Davy and what did Joy Boy have planned for the future that would enable this whale to turn the entire world on its head? Well, let's just take a look at all the other island whales that we've seen thus far and consider that they have one thing in common. They want to destroy the red line and they like being sake too. The red line is obviously unnatural to them and they all are trying to get rid of it. Laboon has tried for years but is too small and we even see other ones in the new world with the same scars. But what if we had a whale that was several magnitudes bigger than the one we've seen thus far? One that could maybe be comparable to Zunisha and one that could be commanded by Joy Boy himself. So yes, I believe that the One Piece is an afro that Luffy needs to wear for the whale to recognize him and be commanded, much like Zunisha. Zunisha, so that it can go and destroy the red line. And speaking of Zunisha, just think about their purpose, which is literally to destroy the borders of Wano by Momo's command specifically. Maybe Davy's purpose is to destroy the borders of the entire world, the red line, and make the world one piece again just like the afro of Joy Boy. I mean, think about Luffy's whole meeting with Laboon now that we've covered all of this. On literally day zero of Luffy's journey into the Grand Line, he stopped Laboon from trying to destroy the Red Line and basically told him to wait until he gets back from the end of his journey. Brook basically did the same thing and even had to come back to life to do it. I mean, technically Luffy did the same thing. It's almost as if they won't be back until they're powerful enough to fulfill 
Laboon's wish and destroy that godforsaken red line to make the world one piece again as it's supposed to be. And even if you don't agree with any of my conclusions, I hope that I opened your mind a little bit and taught you something that you didn't know before. And if you have something to add, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. And please consider dropping a like because it really helps your boy out. And you should also subscribe because I'm finally starting up live reactions and also working on some other exciting stuff behind the scenes. So in the meantime, check out one of these two videos that you should probably already see on the screen. Later.